You're listening to the Scaling Culture Podcast, where we sit down with thought leaders who share their experiences building incredible workplace cultures. Our guest today is Melissa DeMuro, Chief People and Culture Officer at Limbaugh, a public company of 1,700 plus team members delivering engineering, construction, and services solutions to owners and partners across the United States. Since joining the company in January 2021, Melissa has designed a first choice employer strategy to increase stability in a diminishing labor market, resulting for them in 27% less attrition year over year. Previously, Melissa spent 15 years in global leadership roles in GE Aviation, recognized by the CEO of GE Aviation for a culture of innovation leadership. She earned a reputation of scaling businesses and talent. Melissa is a passionate advocate for diversity and has led the strategy for each organization she's been part of, as well as serving as a leader of the GE Women's Network. In this episode of Scaling Culture, Ron and Melissa discuss Limbaugh's 120 years legacy and experience of going from family company to private to public and what things changed and what things stayed the same through that. How to get through to people who resist or won't buy into the culture and change management tactics and the big mistake many leaders make. Welcome to another episode of the Scaling Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Ron Lovett, and today we have Melissa DiMuro with us. Melissa, nice to Hi. see you. Thank you for having me, Ron. Well, um, I'm excited to have you. One, I'm, 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 I'm glad you're safe. You have the, the hurricane happened yesterday, today, sorry? Yeah, it's making its way through right now, actually. Just passed over us, so we're in the clear. In Tampa, Florida, right. And what's yes. the hurricane name again? Uh, Nicole. Nicole, very nice names for these hurricanes. This is this it is. is it's always very deceiving, right? Yes, absolutely. Well, well, look, welcome to the show. And I was um I was excited um because of the business that you're with today. Not just, you know, I, I'm excited to have you as a guest, but also I love this this full, I'm gonna call it a full stack business. It's, and I think not often have we had um companies like uh Limbach presented um where where they have, you know from the back office to front line. So I'm really excited to jump into some topics today. And, and you being, you know, chief people and culture officer there uh, is going to make for an exciting conversation. So thank you for your time. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. So, so Melissa, let's dive into it. What, um, what got you in, we, we've introduced you, but what got you into HR? What was your, what was your aha moment? I want to be dealing with people because, um, and I'm sure you may agree, but people are the most complex side of business you know it's very difficult what what made you wanted to lean into that absolutely it's a it's a great question and i wish i could tell you that from a young age i always knew this is what i wanted to do it is absolutely not the case um so i grew up in a blue collar household um in the auto industry Uh, my dad was a union leader and i visit the shop and hear from people about what their experience was like um in the working world And to be quite honest, I didn't walk away thinking, yeah, that's something I really want to be engaged with. And it wasn't until I got to university and I was studying psychology in my undergrad that I had a mentor pull me to the side and said, you know, what you're doing in these organizational psychology classes and IO psych is is really something that I think would be helpful in HR. Would you ever consider And frankly, I had such a a bias of what I thought that might look like um, that I begrudgingly took his advice and went to um, my first HR role in um, a printing industry. And it was a non-union operation based actually out of Canada, but located in the U.S. Um, And I absolutely loved my job. I had a completely different experience And really, for the first time, had an aha moment that I could change the nature of work for people by going into this field. And um, I stayed there, worked my way through undergrad and into grad school, and ultimately have that uh, to thank for my my transition to the field. So that's great. And you know, have you found? You know, obviously, that was how long ago now? Oh, I guess I've been in the field about 20 years now. So, I mean, I assume you've seen major changes throughout the 20 years, major changes. It's a different field. I feel like, and and now as the world has changed with the pandemic and different things, I feel like it's 10X its changes once again. 
It is. It is. And and the freedom to be in this space, especially if you want to make a difference and make impact, is just tremendous. And I look back, I've had three different industries that are completely different at this point. Um, and and it's a, a transferable skill that you can take from, from one industry to another and just expand yourself so much more. What, what do you think the baseline of that skill is? So, so you know, I, I would argue that doesn't matter what industry you're in. I'm talking about the human understanding humans. What's the baseline skill that you think to be successful, successful you need to transfer with you that you need to have, I should say, so you can transfer? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, um, I would say it's empathy. Um, you know, I, I think of these functional roles and leadership in general as serving the people that you're working for um, and who work for you. Um, and for me, it's all about trying to put yourself in their shoes and understand what life is like for them. And many times these are individuals who are just trying to come to work every day and do the best they can with the information they have. And it's incumbent on us as leaders and functional leaders to be able to sort of meet them where they are and understand how to get them engaged with the direction that we want it ultimately to take as a company. So whether you're working with somebody on the front line, if you're working with an executive or the CEO, anything in between, you have to be able to put yourself in their shoes and understand what it is they're solving for so that you can help find some of that common ground. So Limbach has it obviously it's been around since 1901, right? Yes. Yes. Right. So old company, let's call it old culture. Yeah. How, you know, has the, has the company culture, and I know you're newish to the company, yes. but has, I, I assume you understand some of the history, has oh, yeah. it, really changed? Like what, what pieces have changed over time and what pieces are foundational that are still with it today that might've been there since 1901? Yeah, I think it's a phenomenal question. And just for, for the audience, I, I joined Jess back in January of 2021. So I'm not yet on my two years and the company started as a family company. It transitioned through being public or private, um, public. Now we've been uh, part of larger companies, it's gone through a tremendous amount of evolution in its experience. Um, the things that I think would stay the same um, is the foundation of the core values of the company, which is interesting. They take on a unique and different flavor, um, but in its founding period of time, the care for individuals has always been at the root of that family company atmosphere, started by Walter Limbaugh, you know, back in you know back in time. And um, so it's really about how do we um, how do we care for one another beyond the work that we have to get done? And you know, I can see how over time it's changed dramatically. You know, in 1901, we didn't have technology. Um, we didn't have some of the advanced engineering work and things that we can do at this point. Um, but we also always had a real respect for the expertise on our front line. And at the end of the day, you know, I'm an enabling function. I'm here to support the business. I don't build anything um, that our customers uh, are buying. And so it's all about having that expertise and supporting uh, the people who do, frankly. Um, some of the things that have needed to change, um, you know, construction can historically be viewed as a, as a lagging industry when it comes to culture. Absolutely. Um, I think about, you know, we can talk about um, the, the strides we're making in the diversity space in particular and creating a culture of inclusion. It's historically a very uh, male dominated industry um, with not a ton of diversity. And we're working really hard to change uh, that narrative um, amongst many other things. Uh, that so, uh, uh, yeah, look, that sounds Interesting. I, I'm I'm curious about like when I think of your company at the size and how many different countries are you guys in? We are only in the U.S. Only in the U.S. Sorry. Okay, got it. Yeah. yeah. Um. And so when I think about this company objectively, you're in an old space, right? And so yes. I'm, it's pretty traditional space. I I agree with your comment on construction. And when I put my kind of objective culture hat on, I see two challenges. And please correct me if if these are not two challenges. One is the potentially the 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 introverted engineer brain. If yeah. you look at it at first glance, it's like, do they really want to be involved with culture? This behind a desk say, leave me alone. Like, how do you get them absorbed into the culture? Is that would that be fair or not? Um, I 
would say, you know, there are a number of people, engineers being one dimension, yeah. um, that sometimes think, isn't that touchy feely stuff? Like I right. have buildings to build. I have, you know, I have other things that I need to do. How is this relevant to me? So, you know, whether it's engineering or whether it's our frontline staff, um, you know, you have to make the case for why cult, what is culture? Cause you say it and it's just like this big nebulous thing for people. And how do you um, make so, the case for them? Let's talk that through a little bit. How, how have, yeah. have you guys successfully, and I know not everybody, I, you know, with my security company in the past and yeah. our company today, I believe that not everyone buys in all the time. Right. I just think that's oh, no. right. There's but what, have you made that success or have you made someone that said, look, did you, this is noise. Like I need to get my job done. And now you want me to go to a team building or, fulfill this survey, like leave, leave us alone. You know, how do you get that person on board? Yeah. It's interesting because again, kind of going back to that empathy piece, you have to figure out what's in it for them. And so, you know, I'll give an example. When I joined the company, um, one of the first things that I noticed was our attrition was much higher than I wanted it to be, to be a best in class company in our space. Um, It was definitely not, further out of scope than what the industry was. But my my bar is never to be what the average is in the industry. I wanna be the best in the industry. And so um, I really had to number one, educate our team members on what the impact is every time somebody decides not to stay with us in the company. And in addition to those deciding to leave, what about the people who have decided not to give it their all and stay in the company? And so I went through a, an education campaign, I would say, in the beginning of my time here to not only bring out the human element. Again, I mentioned the, the core value of we care being something that is so important within the company. Um, but some people aren't going to be motivated by that emotional connectivity piece. So then it really comes down to what's the financial and business implications of having the turnover that we did. And once you start to put numbers to it and you start to articulate the number of hours and things like that that are being put into this hidden factory of moving people, you begin to get their attention. And we did a number of different things um, to drive that retention. And I'm happy to say that right now we're down year over year, 29% in total attrition, 18% voluntary. And the leaders are starting to see that come through. So there's there's the emotional part of trying to get them on board. And then you've got to always be prepared for that business case that goes along with it because culture is a requirement for their business strategy. So I, I, I can see that conversation being something like this. Okay, so I'm a complaining individual engineer. It doesn't matter. Um, and I'm upset that leadership is doing this culture talk. And I'm saying, look, you know, we... Um, you know, this is frustrating because because Sarah left and Timmy left. And then it's like, well, yeah, Ron, but, you know, this is a problem. This is, you know, it's it's causing you grief. We need to fix that, which is change the culture, get you involved yes. with it so we keep people there. So just tying it back to the individual, correct? Exactly. And, you know, look, um, people don't always have the full suite of data. They have what they experienced that day. And right. for that individual, it might be one person that left. But I have the benefit of seeing across the entire company. So it's it's on me to make sure that they understand that larger picture. Um, and, you know, one very basic thing that we did is I said, this is important enough to me that I'm going to talk to each leader who has an exiting employee. And I did that for about a year and a half. And I did a personalized debrief with them of what do you think happened? Things of that nature. And comparing what the employee said as they left and what the manager said to help improve that self-awareness and make sure we were taking those lessons learned immediately from that conversation into action. What, what was in that process? What was the biggest trend, biggest learning, biggest, um, you know, variance from what the management, oh, Ron left because of this. What did, what, what, what were some of the things yeah. you found? Yeah, I would say that the number one perception is people leave for money. And that might be a reality of leaving a company that you're able to negotiate a different dollar figure, but that's not why people were leaving. Um, We were amidst the great resignation and there was obviously a ton of movement in in the market. Um, And really what it came down to us is a couple of things, leadership, skill sets, and the experience they were having. 
And the second was clarity of career path, having the organization align to what is most important for that individual. Because again, people are people, they're going to make a decision based on what's best for them and their family. And it's on us as leaders to every day have enough stacking up on the why should I stay list that it's an easy decision for them. And that frankly, in that period of time, wasn't always the case. Interesting. And the second part, what I was going to ask you is, you know, when I go back to my security company, one of the biggest challenges um, and we talked offline about this, uh, you know, I sort of study Southwest and, and uh, Starbucks, but I had a bigger challenge, which I feel like you are faced with too, which was that, you know, our security guards went to, you know, a shopping center, a hospital, a hotel, they were under their influence, their culture, you know, under some 24 hour shift. And so the, the challenge for me, they were low wage too, obviously in the private security, um, lower than those, well, it was close to Starbucks, but we were still probably lower in some cases. But the challenge for us was how do we um, get buy-in, culture buy-in from those individuals that aren't coming to an office with the manager? And I envision your, you know, your frontline workers being in a similar environment. Talk me through that. How have you, what are some of the strategies, challenges slash strategies that you're having in, in, yeah. in developing culture at the front lines? Yeah, I, I love that example that you raised about your your prior employees going to someone else's culture and experiencing it there, because that is, in fact, what what I experienced here. And it was a, a major difference for me growing up in manufacturing um, to not be able to control the total work environment. We are co-located with not only our customers, but many different general contractors and other subcontractors that may or may not share our value system and, and right. what we believe. Um, so, you know, one is I think um, we've tried to do a better job in the company of selecting work and partners based on people and organizations that share our core values. Um, how, do you, how do you screen for that? Let me ask you, like, that's a, that's a challenging one because you're also saying big contract here, or maybe it's, it it's before the contract signed, but that's a tough one. Walk me through how, what, what are some of the things you're doing? Yeah. So, you know, it, it comes down to the pre-screen, you know, for the most part, we operate in local markets, you know, while we have, you know, 16 different offices, we may service roughly 30, um, 30 large city areas. Um, but we sort of know the players and you have enough experience to be able to understand, you know, which ones are going to, um, as an example, support an environment of inclusion on a job site and which ones may not. Um, so to some extent, some of it is local um, knowledge. Secondly, we're actually working as a company to pivot our focus more and more to the owners themselves then historically, we've worked mostly with general contractors. And by doing that, we can control our environment a little bit more. Um, we can do work that maybe is a little bit more specialized for us. And frankly, control putting our, our employees in environments that we think is a better, healthier uh, relationship. That's um, interesting. I yeah, like that so strategy. we're trying to change the customer selection. Um, and by working with owners directly, um, not only is that good for business, right, um, because we can sell our value to them, um, but we believe that, you know, they also then can respect and understand the value that our employees bring to that. We in, we are a, a people business, um, you know, whether it's the service technicians doing the actual servicing of their products or building new or, you know, helping them solve whatever challenges they might have, Um it all comes down to the people themselves. So um, we've been pretty vocal about trying to make sure we're keeping that as just as important of a priority as our other screening criteria for those I, jobs. I love that. You know, I went through something ages ago, not ages ago now, I guess with, it was our new company in uh, Vita. And we had a contractor came into the office and just like berated one of the girls there. It was about payments or something like that. And they went off. And the admin at the time actually challenged me and said, like, you know, we're talking about company culture and values and blah, blah, blah. And just going to let this guy like torch me like that. And I was like, no, no, we can't. But how? And, the, and, and that was my kind of 
yeah. you know, a look in the mirror moment for what are we going to do about that? And, and long story short, we, we end up letting the contractor go and said that, that you just, you know, you can't interact with us like that. What you do behind your own doors is your business, but how yeah. you interact with us. And then we thought, how do we police that? And we're still working on, but what we've done is, you know, we have our values and sub language around those values. And then we have what's called like line in the sand portions of those values. So a good example of that would be, you know, in our values, for instance, under um, relentless improvement, it would say always going back to the drawing board on, on old process mm -hmm. that we would hold someone at the office level accountable to, mm -hmm. but a line, in the sand portion would be always taking responsibility and owning, taking responsibility and owning it every time that we would hold subcontractors to. Okay. And so interesting. We, yeah. And we put it in the agreement. We basically said, look, we don't care if you're a big garbage company, but if your interaction with us are offside here, we, we, this contract is null and void. And so we've started doing that. And, and I'll tell you, it, um, I believe it's, it's, I think it's doing, um, I think it's doing wonders where I think we're failing actually. And I just wrote this down as we're talking is I don't, I'm probably using aggressive language. I don't have confidence. Yeah, that's probably fair. I don't have confidence that the contractors that we use then transfer that knowledge down to their front line. And so I think it's our job to, to, to show a video, an onboarding video to talk to their staff about it and say, this is what you've signed up for. And I, I think we that. have to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. And, you know, it's, it's an evolution in process. We are by right. no means perfect. Um, you know, there's often a gap between intention and reality. You have the best of intentions every day as a leader, and you're trying to close that gap between what you want to be true and what's actually happening on the front line. Um, but I, I do hope that our employees understand that they can come forward and raise these topics and we will address them. Right. And, um, you know, I, I'm seeing evidence, you know, you had asked previously, you know, what evidence or, or how am I seeing this play out in the organization? Um, most recently, we've been doing a lot of work in the diversity and inclusion space. Um, and, you know, we have this overarching um, umbrella that we call Embrace, which is our grassroots team that works on, you know, DE&I in the space um, of, of the company and of the industry. And um, it is a collection of people at all different levels that want to see things be different. And um, I guess it was about a month ago during um, National Hispanic Heritage Month here in the U.S. Uh, that we had a group of employees actually come together and self-form our first Hispanic employee resource group. Mm -hmm. And it's named Unidos. And um, it was created out of, you know, our Harper business in Florida. And just the passion and excitement of that team um, to pull it together and launch a whole host of events across uh, across the, the month um, was just really special. And, you know, we asked them, you know, what is it that made you want to do this? And the stories that they could tell us about wanting things to be different than they historically have and being given the opportunity to have a platform to make that change, you know, so while that is starting within our company, there are many other companies in our space and construction that have similar ambitions. And I think, you know, it's it's the actions of every individual company that eventually creates momentum where right. it becomes part of the industry. And then those that are not um, being inclusive, et cetera, are going to be out of place in uh, an industry that's shifting in a different way. Yeah. Okay. Totally, totally agree. I I, I want to go back to the other part of the last question, though. I'm I'm curious. How do you solve the front line, keeping them uh, close to the culture? Do they, you know, we're back to what we were discussing, um, Melissa, which is they go to a customer and they're working on a project for two months, and so, you know, do they come to the office every day to get their rah rah, and then they off they go? Like, how are you connecting with frontliners that don't don't that work at customers' places? What's some of the because that's yeah. challenging. It is It is very challenging. And I'll be the first to say that um, we're not where I want us to be. So let's start there. Um, I, I've i seen um, tremendous examples of our local leadership getting out where the work gets done. So yes, we bring them in for a rah-rah, 
But I think equally or more important for me is that our leaders are out there seeing the work and recognizing the contributions on the job site. Um, it can be easy to sort of fall into a trap of sitting in your office and managing from afar. Um, and I, you know, really trying to get folks out on the job site. So, you know, I think of, um, you know, examples where, you know, it can be tough environments. It can be in Florida, you know, 125 degrees outside and they're, you know, working out in the um, elements. It can be frigid in our, you know, New England branch. And, and people need to know that you understand what it's like to work in the environment that they're working in. And by going and showing them the respect of caring about the work that they're doing, they're more likely to open up to you on things that you can do differently and help them if you ask them the right questions. So first and foremost, I would say go into the job sites and actually walk in a mile in their shoes. Um, and, you know, that's something that I learned early on and has been sort of a core component of, of how I've led. The other thing is, um, you know, we have the typical surveys, as you can imagine, to get employees feedback. And, and we take that very seriously. Um, and most recently, we actually hired an external company to come in and do focus groups and tell us what some of our blind spots are. So sometimes when, when you're the company leadership and you're consistently asking the questions, you might get one answer, but having someone else come in that's an unbiased source that's there to really peel back the onion can sometimes help you as well. And also add credibility that you really are trying to get this thing right. You know, it's funny. I, I, I think you're spot on. I, I've found, and this has been challenging for me as my new business is growing, um, I used to be able to say things like, you know, okay, Melissa, what's one thing we can do better? And I used to probably get an okay answer there. And and now I forget that, okay, geez, I've, I, I'm, you know, someone could find me intimidating. Okay, you're an author and, you know, whatever they think of of me could be intimidating and, and, th and there's a lack of relationship. And so I've had to really pivot that language to like, hey, Melissa, look, um, I'd like to talk to you about a few things that are keeping me up at night that I think are, are a problem. Mm -hmm. And I and I'd love to get your help. I have to use where the help in in solving. Like, what do you, you know? And are you okay? I have to get your permission to even have this conversation. Yes, Ron. Okay, that sounds good. Great. Here's my challenge. What do you think? Am I wrong? Like, I need help with this. What are your thoughts? And so, getting their counsel yes. uh, versus just like, tell me how to make my business better. It's like, no, yeah. everything's yeah. fine. I don't know. Do everything's you find that wonderful? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I I love that. And I think what you're doing is not only creating a safe space, which is you recognize that not everything is going perfectly every day. Um, and then secondly, engaging them to help co-create a solution. Um, and I think, you know, so many times as leaders, we can sort of trick ourselves into thinking that we know more than we do. Right. And the reality is we don't live doing their job each and every day. And so if we're not consistently asking them, we are likely missing the data points that can help us make the right strategic decisions. You know, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I also think, you know, and I think you're saying this too, is at the decision level, you know, we, we could be in the boardroom and this happened just the other day. Yeah. We're looking at these potential ads for our customers. And do we like this emoji? Do we like that? And it's like, stop, 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 stop. Somebody go talk to the customer and see if they even like this. Why are we <laughs> yes. even discussing this? We're a bunch of knuckleheads. What are we doing? You're right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so, and it's like that with your frontliners too. I think, you know, um, I had a big aha moment ages ago when I had the security company and, and it was that we were planning for people that weren't in the room. And, and that really was, um, yeah. That was really, um, I, I don't know what the word, I was going to be too aggressive. I was going to swear, actually. I was going to say really dumb. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, planning for people that are in the room is not fair. It's not right. Yeah. And so, and you miss things. You're not close to the yeah. challenge. You have your perspective to your point. And, you know, and I always remember we had a security guard come to a quarterly planning session, right? A frontline <laughs> leader. And we were talking about uniforms. We couldn't figure out these uniforms of how we, you know, how we were executing. I had our accountant uh, assistants. I had everybody try to run our uniform store. Mm 
And then we're talking about it in a quarterly uh, planning session. Then a security guard says, you know, like you guys are all about decentralization. Why can't we just order direct from the company you order from and it gets sh drop shipped direct to us. And you, you got the same email, go to our, uh, to accounting to take it off our pay. And I'm like, Oh my God, what exactly. are you doing? And then of course the account had their backup. I'm like, no, this is over. We are done with this right away. We just solved this problem by having someone in that room real time. Have you, have you felt that? And, and, and you know, what yes. are your thoughts? Yes, absolutely. And you know, one of the things, so when I came into the company, I spent basically 90 days out in the field and listening and meeting people. Um, and I did my best to reserve all judgment for that period of time and really just listen. Um, and so one of the top things that I heard in that conversation was we need to do a better job of change management. Um, and just because the leadership team reaches a decision doesn't mean that the process is finished. Um, there has to be not only voice of that customer or the employee or whoever the stakeholders are early on and throughout the process, but then there has to be a very methodical way that that is taken out to the organization and using small groups to get feedback. And so we launched a whole campaign, I guess it was a year ago at this point, um, around what does good change management look like and put together a training for all leaders in the company and actually a little cheat sheet for them that basically coaches them through, if you're gonna create a change, here's the steps you need to go through. And by completing this change management document, it helps you sort of think through the scenarios. You have to list out right. who are my stakeholders, what's the benefits and risks that they're going to see in this change and really get it down to that level. And, you know, look, it's it's an evolution and process, but I've seen tremendous improvement in our ability to anticipate those voices because we're actually engaging them in the process. But I don't know about you, but I found in the security world and now in, in our business with Vita, we have a lot of frontliners. We call them building ambassadors. That's our version mm -hmm. of the of the superintendent or the uh -huh. resident manager. And so what we would do, very similar to that, we would incorporate them into the change, into the pilot. Those who are in the pod that make the adjustments that work with us then become mm -hmm. the experts then yes. they are the ones who are the experts that execute the change. So it's become this wonderful, um, you talked about career path. I'll, case, I'll, call, I'll say that or success path. They get to yes. get involved in something different from the data. They, they, they then become this expert who executes change. And it's been a great way for people to grow within the business. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so I wanted to talk to you. I know one of the topics here was crowdsourcing uh, development ideas amongst engineers. I didn't understand. Can you talk, walk, talk us through that? Because yeah. I have some questions. Yeah. So this um, that example really comes from um, when I was back at GE. So I spent uh, 15 years with GE and 10 of which were spent um, really supporting our engineering division. And we were in the aviation business. Um, so you can imagine um, we have 10,000 or so engineers that you know, are responsible for designing the, um, you know, jet engines that we fly on each day. And, you know, this was a time in which um, open source crowdsourcing was becoming more and more prevalent. Hackathons on the technology and engineering side were very common. And we were starting to see that really as something they wanted to engage in um, and come up with creative new ways to solve challenges. And so one day there was a, a team with me and ultimately decided, you know, why can't we do that for culture, right? So let's already lean into the platform they're using. Let's figure out how to make what we call open innovation events um, around some of the cultural behaviors that we believe are getting in our way of being successful at the company. And we sort of defined culture as both the what you do each day and the how you do it, how you make decisions, what type of leadership, you know, all of those kind of things. We educated the team on what we were looking for. And then we launched them around some of our toughest business challenges. So an example um, of, of one that we did was on cash generation of the company. You know, we need to achieve this level. Um, here's the behavior that we're looking for and the result what is it that's getting in your way today? And what ideas do you have to solve it? 
Um, we also did some around. Let's say, uh, quick, quick question that did you, sure. I'm just trying to envision how you do that at a large company. Did you gamify that? Like, how do you get the transfer of information back and forth? Was it gamified? Yeah. So yeah, tell me. To about- some extent. Yeah. So there was an open um, innovation platform that we already used within the company for the technology side. So essentially you can design your own challenge. You can put the parameters. It's open for a certain duration. And then teams of people or individuals could submit proposals of how you might be able to solve for it. And what's really cool is it would kind of come up and people could build off of other people's ideas as well. So you found that maybe it wasn't the first idea that was the winner. It was the subsequent ideas that really built on the momentum and and ideation of others off of that first idea. And so we did that and because we were a global company, you know, with over 50% of our workforce outside of the U.S. and in many different countries, um, it allowed everyone to engage and feel as though they were part of the solution. Uh, You didn't have to worry about time zones. It was accessible at all times. And um, we really saw that it sort of democratized the um, ability to have a voice and make change within the organization. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, what's what's something else we haven't talked about? We've kind of covered some interesting topics here. What's something that you, you think about that you're working on that we haven't talked about, Melissa? Yeah, you know, I would say um, one of the top things that's on my mind these days is in construction, um, we have a significant labor shortage that we're dealing with. Um, I know sort of everyone feels like they're dealing with a labor shortage in these times. Um, But, you know, we, you know, by all accounts, um, estimate that between this year and next, we'll actually have 1.2 million jobs go unfilled because there are, there's more demand than there is supply. And you add on top of that, we have an aging demographic of the um, industry where almost 25% of individuals will be at retirement age in the next five years with only about 9% coming in to sort of fill that. Wow. Big deficit. And, you know, that, that is very, very challenging um, because as a business, you need to figure out how are you going to grow and evolve um, and uh, be competitive long-term. So, you know, that's part of why I was asked to join the company and we're working really hard to not only develop talent, but to figure out how to accelerate it too. Um, Accelerate from the inside or outside or both? Both, both. Yeah, yeah what's some um, of the stuff you're you're piloting, thinking about, innovating yeah. on? I'm very curious. Great. Because I'm, so, and I think everybody's going through this. Yeah, it, it is such a challenge. Um, and and I'll say it's multiple things because if it was just one thing, we would have all done it already and figured it out. Um, so first and foremost, working on career pathing. We talked about that as one of the top things I've heard from people coming in, and one of the top ways to get them to stay. So we've really put in place career paths across the organization, increase the visibility of that. And then we've also built out a learning curriculum so that we can accelerate the development of our talent inside the company, created a three-tier leadership development program um, from aspiring leaders through sort of current mid-level leaders and those who hope to get to the executive level. Um, where, you know, it can be upwards of a year long commitment that we are engaging with them on contemporizing and building their leadership skills. Um, We've also looked at specific training to accelerate skill gap areas that we have, such as project management, as an example, out in the field. And so, you know, not only are we trying to clarify the path for people from a career perspective, but then give them the tools and resources in order to be successful. Um, You know, in addition to that, we're working to expand our talent pools. Uh, we, We need to figure out how to change the perspective of construction in many people's minds and attract from adjacencies. So as an example, um, you know, we participate right now in the ACE Mentor Program. The ACE Mentor Program is all about going out to high school kids 
and getting them excited to be in the trades, many of which come from disadvantaged backgrounds and may not know what they're going to do once they get out of high school. Um, we partner with them as an organization, and frankly, it's good for them, it's good for the community, it's, it's good all the way around, right? Um, so just trying to think about how do we get people to want to come into the industry, like myself, um, and see the value in, in career opportunities that exist. I think also um, helping elevate um, the craft careers, um, you know, going to college is a great option for many people. Right. However, it's not the only way that you can go on to have an amazing career and really just showcasing the type of work that people do and how that can be good for you and your family as well. And how do you position the company for the, the, the last bucket, which is you're in the industry, we want you to come work for us. How, how do you ah. position yourself? How do you cut through the noise? Yeah. We're going through this now and I'd love to talk strategy back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so again, we are, are leaning much more um, forward, I would say, into contemporizing both culture and uh, the ways we're working. So um, examples, um, I already spoke about our leadership development program. We are positioning ourselves as one of the best places you can come to learn um, and be invested in for the long term. And ultimately, yeah. once they join, it's on us to prove why you should stay with us. But Those that's are part skills of your, you can take anywhere. Right, but that's part of your pitch. Hey, Ron, here's right. what your experience is going to be here. That's, here's what's in it for you. on the, on the the. I, I assume you're seeing that in the job ad. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times these days, you're talking to passive candidates that have a great job somewhere else. And it's convincing them that, you know, not only do we have these opportunities for development, but our core value, our top one is we care. Like we care about you as a human being. So we want you to be successful in doing what you want from a life perspective too. Um, we've focused a lot on um, hybrid work environments and making sure that we have wherever possible um, opportunities for people to flex their time, work where they need to. And that's not always the case in construction. And there's always the portion of folks that look, you can't build a building from your couch. Like that's not going to happen. Um, however, we try to give the freedom and autonomy wherever possible. Um, and then finally, I would say we're really leaning in on the diversity front. So, um, you know, Ron, as an example, in the construction industry, um, and I didn't fully understand this all um, until I, I immersed myself into it when I joined, um, there are only 10% women in the entire industry. Wow. If you take it to the field level at the craft um, perspective, so these are our plumbers, our sheet metal, our electricians, et cetera. 1%. It goes down to one and a quarter percent. I was close. You are. And it's just, so we are essentially not tapping into 50% of the world's population. And so I use that just for illustration. Yeah. There's obviously many other ways that we need to grow and expand. But we are trying very hard to create an environment and a value proposition that this is somewhere that you can come regardless of your background and right. have a great career. Because, you know, with a, a challenge in the labor market like this, frankly, it's crazy not to open yourself up to the entirety of the pool, not right. to mention it being great for business, great for people and great for culture. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that's a great strategy. And it's, those are eye opening numbers. You know, uh, I think about some of the things we've done very similar to you as far as like, look, here's our purpose, our mission. Here's, you know, here's what's in it for you. Here's what your experience is going to be like. Here's what, um, here's what the team will be like, the, the, the environment that you're going to work on. Here's the opportunities. Here's the benefits. And then here's the things that, you know, would be helpful if you could check these boxes. We've also added a couple other things in that one, just recently shot a video of myself, just kind of talking about the company culture in case someone's a video person. So a link. Mm -hmm. And then we also use employee references. We'll say, if you don't believe, if this is too good to be <laughs> true, reach out to these yeah. people, they'll tell you they're employees. And then I, I love actually, it. Yeah. I recently had a, a colleague, Andrew Dart on the podcast and that episode was released a few weeks ago. Uh -huh. And we, we put that link to say, Hey, and Here's someone talking from our business, put our money where our mouth is, listen to someone from the business, talk about the business. And so, you know, because I think, 
you know, you're right. You have to be thinking very strategic, very broadly about how do you solve these problems. I, I, I will say I'm happy to hear you talk like that because there are a lot of companies and it shocks me, even like younger businesses that have only been around for a short period of time that are just waving up the flag saying it's everybody's problem. No, it's everyone has this issue. But if you do that, then you're the same company you were yesterday. You know, you I just- agree. You've got lazy because you you said uh, it is what it is. And so you yeah. don't innovate, you know? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, for me at least personally, and I know this as well about a number of members of our leadership team, like I don't want to be average. Average is boring. <laughs> I, I want to be the best in whatever dimension that we're going after. So if we say we want to be the best from an employee experience perspective, and really taking care of the people that work for us, we kind of need to put our, you know, actions in line with that. Um, and, you know, that's also the other value proposition for folks looking to join us is, you know, you can work for someone who's okay with the status quo, or you can come take what might be perceived as the tougher challenge of trying to shift an industry that's sort of been there, done that for a long time. But you can actually make a difference where your voice actually matters. And I think over time, I've started to see more and more people join who are more of that mindset than um, than not. It, well, it's divisive, but it but it, it it's a filter. Those who are up for that bigger challenge, right, will come and say, "This is for me. I'm going to come on." These they're trying to move the needle, so that, that's great. Well, look, Melissa, thanks so much for your time today. I've really enjoyed the conversation, and I appreciate um, your ass kicking. Um, <laughs> uh, perspective and wanting to do the best. And so, so I appreciate that. And you're going to move mountains uh, wherever you, uh, wherever you're working. And so thanks. Thanks for providing your, uh, your counsel for our listeners today. Wonderful. And thank you for having me. I, I have enjoyed being an active podcast listener now for a while in your book. So it was uh, a pleasure to have an opportunity to join you today. Thank you. Well, let's keep in touch. For more information about Melissa, please follow her on LinkedIn. To learn more about our books or our Scaling Culture Masterclass on how to build and sustain a resilient, high-performing team, please go to scalingculture.org. And lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a comment and share the podcast with one of your friends or colleagues. We'll be back soon with another incredible guest.